Welcome everyone to the Contact Center Perspectives Podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, your host. Today, we've got a really interesting guest in conversation here with Thomas Lehner. And Thomas, you are the Global Director of Operations and Support for an e-commerce company. You support people all throughout the globe. You are constantly innovating on your product. In fact, you are adding additions to the product on a daily basis, which actually provides some complexities in training and operating the team. So I want to get into that a little bit. But you actually started your career as an entrepreneur in the early stages. You've been a consultant. Maybe expand a little bit on your background before we jump into what are the entrepreneurial lessons that CX leaders need to know and understand? Absolutely, Steve. Thank you. And also thanks for having me. So I studied entrepreneurship in beautiful Scotland. I started a software development company, startup with a friend of mine. And so we basically back in the days, helped customers and companies to put together websites or e-commerce platforms to run their business on. And this is something that we did parallel to our studies and what also helped us finance our studies a little bit there. So this is basically my entrepreneurial background. This company that we started back in the day, we dissolved after we finished our studies. So it's not something that we pursued further, but I think it taught me a lot of valuable lessons. And I look back to those days very fondly every day, pretty much. That's a really great place to start here because it's the idea of an entrepreneurial mindset that you think every company needs to have and specifically how it impacts CX leaders. So maybe if you could just give us your overview on that in terms of what is important in terms of a mindset, an entrepreneurial mindset that we need to have. It's actually, I think, quite interesting and can be very beneficial. There's a very interesting paper called Intercorporate Entrepreneurship. I think it's from Gifford Pincho and Elizabeth Pincho. And in this paper, they basically explain a little bit about what kind of benefits they see for people using a more entrepreneurial mindset, working in a company that they do not own. So basically the entrepreneur, so to speak. And I really like to think that this mindset has very beneficial effects on companies if they manage to create the right kind of cultural environment for entrepreneurs. So if we take a look at what is important in entrepreneurship, I think you will not be able to run a successful company if you do not manage to deliver sustainable, relevant value for your customers. I think this is what it all boils down to. So your offering needs to be attractive. It needs to satisfy a need. And you need to consistently produce relevant value and uh, sustainable value for your customers. And I think the sustainable part of that sentence is quite important. And the first thing that is really valuable for people to have in working companies that are not their own, I think the sustainable mindset is you work with what you currently have. You do not request a lot of expensive things and start thinking, okay, I need this and I need that and I need that. You basically start thinking, okay, this is what I have. What can I do with these things that I have now and maximize the output, maximize the value. And I think what is really helpful for entrepreneurs as well is to whatever they start doing or whatever they are working on is to once in a while sit back and say, okay, this activity that I'm currently performing, how is that connected with providing sustainable value for our customers, mm -hmm. right? Because if you think about it, if your whole company thinks this way, you run a very centered, a very focused company. And I think it's very valuable for people to reflect on what they're doing every day in this context, because they will also identify a lot of fault lines in your business processes, they will avoid waste naturally because they have the sustainable mindset and think, okay, how can I do with the same amount or how can I do more with less even? And I think they will always think about the customer this way and whatever they are doing is targeted towards uh, providing value for that customer. And I think this is the most significant part of being an entrepreneur to always have this mantra, so to speak. It's interesting. I've, I've run my own companies for the last 20 years. And so I know the entrepreneurial mindset very well. And one of the things that you're never satisfied with, you're never satisfied with the value you're providing. You are always looking to expand the value that you provide. It is a competitive advantage for the business. Whereas an employee mentality is, what's enough? Because that's really all that I want to do. It's not an expansion kind of a mentality. It's a, what's enough to get the job done? That is not the way that you run a successful business. So when you say value, yeah, we hear the word value so much. It's so generic, but it's not. 
it's a never ending pursuit is what I'm taking away from what I'm hearing what you're saying. Absolutely. Can be very damaging for you if you are stuck with people that do what is enough and don't look at ways of how to maximize value for your customers. I think it's poison for a company. But to be honest with you, in my opinion, sometimes the fault is with the leaders and managers of those people that develop these kind of mindsets, because I think that we often incentivize maybe with the wrong kind of things. So if you think about it, if you want to motivate people to really think about stuff that is abstract, like value and customer value, let's say you run a contact center and want to motivate a support engineer to think about the value you're providing to a customer, something that might realize in one or two years time. It's really long-term stuff. Many times those people working in those contact centers or support organizations, they develop a fixation on small things, on closing that case as fast as possible, providing that response as fast as possible, because this is what managers historically place emphasis on. So you, you run reports, you see how your team is doing, how fast they are responding to, to cases, how fast do they mitigate issues? And then you tell them they did good or they did not. I think that this leads to people looking for instant gratification, those kind of minor things, and they forget that what they actually should be pursuing is something more profound, something that might be a little bit more abstract, but is infinitely more valuable to your customer, which is providing sustainable value. And I think if you adjust a little bit the metrics and if you adjust a little bit your reporting and take a look at things like, do we have a lot of cases that get reopened? Or let's take a look at what kind of cases we have during the different life cycles of our customers during the customer journey and how those develop over time and whether we can maybe bring down the average cases that a customer reports to us. So the average problems that our customers report to us over time, I think is more aligned with this idea of providing sustainable value rather than incentivizing, providing a quick response or a quick mitigation. I think it's a little bit more about the responsibility and the scope of a team leader or manager to provide the right kind of incentives for people to be motivated to provide this kind of sustainable value. And the support team is probably in absolute best position to provide sustainable value because they are talking to customers every single day. And the customer is the highest authority in any business. So. If you're the one that has the constant communication about products, about promises that were made in a marketing campaign, about issues that are coming up, about trends in the industry that you're playing in, and, and are you adapting or what are you guys going to be doing? This is golden information to translate into the rest of the organization, starting with product development. When you talk about sustainable value, it's about understanding the industry and the customer and their needs better than anyone else. Yep. So we should be requiring our agents, our support teams to be looking for how they can augment the value that we create, being that megaphone, that feedback mechanism, reflecting that into the organization. Tell me a little bit, you're on a global organization in a very fast paced, product driven environment. How do you train for that? How do you teach people to do that? I think it's the feedback mechanism and closing feedback loops with, with customers and partners. It's really, it's an amazing thing. And I think people should spend more time on it and also mapping it out and making sure that this is a conscious process, not something that happens by accident, but the conscious effort also to gather this feedback and make sure that it's processed very well. I think support, as you mentioned, is like the eyes and ears of a company pretty much. So they are in very close contact, as you said, with customers and partners. They know about issues in a very intimate way. And their job is to inform the product organization, inform managers, also marketing, sales, customer success, and so on about any kinds of signals that customers and partners give. Because when we said before, value is an abstract thing, it rightfully is because it is constantly evolving. If you satisfied one need of a customer, they develop more, right? So value is constantly evolving. And this is why you constantly need to have your eyes and ears open. And this feedback is not something that you do once a year. You need to do it consistently, continuously. And since you asked, how do we do it in Spryker and how can it be done optimally? I think support is as many contact centers, customer facing centers. It's an interface for customers and partners to provide feedback. And customers and partners provide feedback in many different ways. They might 
create cases and you need them to abstract or interpret the cases and the feedback and move them on to the next owner that might provide them with more direct ways of providing feedback via forms or whatever interviews. And I think whatever you do, the most important thing is that you do it consciously and it's very prominent and partners and customers, if you ask them, where can you provide feedback, they immediately are able to point it out. They shouldn't say, I don't know. I don't know who to tell, who to contact. I think the feedback process is a little bit similar to the very classic incident management process in the sense that you have one stage where you gather via the interface that you provide the feedback. Then you have a stage where you validate that feedback because feedback can also be overwhelming in product organizations or management level specifically. I think you need to be careful also not to overwhelm. You need to filter things because if we stay with the example of an eye and ears, sensory overload is also not helping. The same as sensory deprivation is not helping. You need to provide feedback in the right kind of dose and also the right kind of quality. And I think this validation step is very important. You check, is this feedback valid? Is it addressing maybe, for example, a bug? Is it addressing a feature that is consistent with our strategic direction? Then you have a step where you prioritize those things. You look around and see, okay, what kind of feedback do I get? Likely you get a lot of feedback. So you need to understand what is more important than the other things. Yeah, you need to triage those things. And then I think one of the very critical steps is then assigning the right owners for that feedback. If that feedback is not addressing your support organization directly, you want to hand over that feedback. If it is a bug, for example, or a feature request, you might want to hand this over to the engineering or product department. And to be able to do this, I think you need to translate that feedback first into their language. Not always the language that customer partner will use is the same as your product or engineering organization. So then it needs to be a translation step to make sure that the message is transmitted optimally in the step as well. I think it's super important to have formalized service contracts, also basically internal SLAs that you agree on with those other teams that you regularly hand feedback over to. So that basically you explain, this is how we deliver you feedback. This is what we expect in return. So basically maybe an estimation on time to resolve or time to implement that feature request. Or something very simple as just explaining where feedback should be put. Should it be put into Confluence, into Jira, via email? All of those very trivial things. And I think what makes this so important to have these kind of service contracts is that it makes it very easy for you to onboard new people into that process, which reduces the effect rate of this very important business process. And also it allows you to track your performance. I'll be meeting the SLO service level objectives that we have in those SLAs, yes or no? How do they develop historically? This is just for due diligence of improving your continuous improvement, pretty much. And then I think we need to close the feedback loop at one point as we have received information on what will happen with the feedback, with the bug report, with the feature request. And then we should really honor the time that the customer and partner put into reporting that stuff to us and get back to them. Basically explain to them, this is how we process your feedback. This is what will happen. This is potentially how you can get or how you can stay up to date on what's happening with your feedback, right? Or ultimately, this is our decision. And you might tell them that the feature will be implemented or the bug will be resolved. Or you might even tell them, this is not something that we're currently looking into because of that reason. Closing that feedback loop is very important, even if sometimes you cannot relay a happy message to them. I think it's still honoring and making sure that this exchange is something that is reliable and people can trust and you are taking them seriously. How many times as customers have we given feedback and we've never heard anything from it? And you feel like just a number, you feel like you weren't taken seriously. That feedback mechanism is one of the most important parts of a customer experience. They have voiced a concern. They have voiced an opinion. And the worst thing we can do is just never get back to them. Absolutely. It's a little bit strange. I think that the relationship we have with feedback is quite difficult because you also run into the risk of receiving negative feedback. And some people, they do not like to hear negative feedback. But on a meager level, you as an entrepreneur or as someone who's running a company, this is basically your target group telling you what you need or what they need. <laughs> 
which makes it a hell of a lot easier for you to provide sustainable value. So it's absolutely essential, as you said, we need to do all that we can to make sure that those feedback loops and feedback processes are really working very well. Super essential. Direct benefit to the growth of the company, direct benefit in terms of an experience to the customer and making them feel heard. We all know just as humans, if we feel heard, we feel better. What is the impact on the agents themselves? If they feel that the feedback that they're receiving, that they're articulating, is actually being heard internally by their superiors, by other departments that is being used to help mold and grow the company, what does that do to their feeling of importance in a part of this whole system? I think it's one of the most powerful motivators for them, because if you are the one that is responsible for, for transmitting information, that will potentially help hundreds of customers have an easier time with your product and making more money with your product faster. I think that is very meaningful. I think that individuals or people working in support, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes they are living in a very small world that basically doesn't expand for more than just processing cases. I think it's super important also for managers to make sure that those people have visibility on how their actions, processing the feedback, validating it, refining it, handing it over to the right people, how that does a tangible impact on the success of partners, customers, and ultimately the company that they're working for. There's something that this has been reported by Gartner in a number of other studies and surveys. And it talks about in today's environment where most companies have between 20 and 25 different competitors, the competitive landscape is absolutely intense. What we did yesterday, what we do today to compete and have sustainable competitive advantage over our competition is something we need to think about and not take lightly at all. Companies don't, but we tend to rely on price. We tend to rely on product and the sustainable competitive advantage in these studies has concluded that it is CX. It is the experience that we create. As much as we innovate and we constantly are rolling out new products and technologies and benefits, none of them can be sustainable over time because they can be duplicated by our competition. What is your point of view? Because you obviously are a very product-driven organization, right? You are constantly innovating and you have to have a good product. You absolutely have to. But what is your point of view on the long-term sustainable competitive advantage for a company being CX? I'm telling you this as a German. There's the saying that the Germans are very bad at service. Yeah, they don't care for service and they are very bad at providing service. And I'm saying this to you as a German. I think that CX, the experience that we are providing to our customers, to our partners, and I think that the support experience is a big part of it. It can be a very powerful and maybe also a little bit overlooked source for competitive advantage because let's take a look at what makes a competitive advantage really meaningful. So it needs to be hard to copy from your competitors, needs to be meaningful to your customers, and it needs to be sustainable in a way that you can keep this up for an extended period of time. So I think these are the aspects of what makes a competitive advantage really meaningful. And if you take a look at the support part of the things that we talked about, the mindset of people going the extra mile and basically reflecting on how they can provide better value every day to their customers, motivating this change in mindset is not something that can be done easily. We speak about this in a manner that just do it and people will be fine, but it's super hard to do. You need the right people to start with. You need to have the right managers. You need to have the right processes in place. And you really need to buy into this idea to get this done because you also need to sacrifice some things for them. And I think a company that says that customer experience in my contact centers is something that I'm absolutely serious about. And I take the people working in the contact center seriously. And maybe I change a little bit my attitude towards them and allow them space to grow and take the risk. This can be a very beneficial experiment to make for companies. I think it's very hard to replicate it because your competitor also needs to find the right people. 
They need to have the right leaders. They need to have the right processes in place. I think if you are a company that trusts their leaders and trusts their people, I think this is a competitive advantage that can be built, should be built, and then can be very powerful in a very good differentiator to your competition. Because there are a lot of companies out there that have great product, but they do not manage to make the customer successful with the products because they're not enabled, they are not connecting the value chain, so to speak. They have great product, but they do not get it out into the customer's hands because they do not have an intact value pipeline. They do not have the teams that would buy into the vision, that communicate the vision, that go the extra mile and also think, what can I do to make the customer journey easier? Okay, the customer that I'm interacting with now is in a particular stage of the life cycle with us. A motivated employee will think about the issues that they're having now Next stage, they will be having entirely different sets of issues. What I can do now in rendering my help or consulting them in a certain way is to potentially maneuver them away from those pitfalls, increasing or decreasing the time to value for them. We are making sure that they can go live quicker with less issues and so on. So in my opinion, often overlooked, but in my opinion, potentially very powerful competitive advantage if you can pull it off to create this cultural environment for, for the people. It's interesting. We remember things 22 times more if we hear it in a store. And I was talking to another gentleman just about this, about the competitive advantage. And he said, when I buy, and this was the chief security officer at the company, when I buy, the most important thing that I'm looking for is what's the experience afterwards? Because they all have platforms that say they can do this, they can do X, they can do Y, they can do Z. But if I don't have the team internally with that new partner or vendor that I brought on, that's going to help me be successful. It's the implementation and the constant adherence to how are we successfully constantly innovating in what we're doing together. That's the differentiator. He said it was all about the experience. To your point, product is not what it used to be today. There used to be lots of patents and all kinds of different things technologically that had very sustainable competitive advantages. That is no longer the case today. Yeah, I think people also get into the habit of prioritizing ticking off boxes. As if you look at RFIs, for example, where people are requesting information on your product and they send you like a, a questionnaire, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? It was historically important that you could tick off all that boxes. Yeah? But I think to the point that you're making, if that is true, if feature completeness is what makes a product good, then that vendor that has the most boxes ticked will have the most successful customers. But if we look around, it's often not the case. And those people that maybe have a more reduced scope and say, I want to do this and that and this very good, and I make sure that my value pipeline is working and I have the people in the contact center that actually make sure that the customer can use those points that I ticked off. I think they are more successful in the long run. Absolutely. This all hinges back on what you were talking about earlier, the focus on people. And there's this kind of tug of war going on right now, but human versus AI. And in our previous conversations, you were very much in favor of, there's a lot of benefits that AI is bringing, but there's never going to be a replacement for the human interacting with customers mm. in delivering that experience. Now, AI is a part of the experience, right? CX is a very broad swath, but what is your opinion on human versus AI? Mm -hmm. I think AI is such an interesting topic. It's an understatement to say it's an interesting topic. I think it is disrupting so many industries. We do not even understand fully how disruptive it is for us. So we really uh, do not know it yet. I'm very much looking forward to the next innovation cycle where AI matures even more. I think that the discussion is not, is not so much about AI versus human. It's about more, for me personally, about AI and human. Because I think personally, I think the winning combination right now is humans working with AI. As you mentioned, I do not think that where we are at right now, that AI can replace humans in most functions that you have in, in contact centers, because I think there's a couple of things that we need to sort out in AI and some things we might potentially never be able to sort out. At least what I think about AI, I'm not sure how to properly secure AI from a security perspective. 
I think this is one very big challenge. Personally, I do not expose AI directly to customers and partners for that reason. Yeah. And also, if we look at other early adopters where they went ahead and, and provided direct access to AI via chatbot on their website, for example, some of them had great success with it and saved a lot of costs. Others, not so much. Others maybe got into trouble for doing that because the AI was a little bit too helpful or too revealing in the information it provided or promised stuff that, that the company then needed to deliver. So I think the guardrails are not yet very well understood, at least from my side. I do not personally understand how to properly provide guardrails for AI and security and then in security kinds of way. What I really think and I encourage in my team as well is people should work with AI. And I think my team, myself, we work with AI multiple times a day. I think it's an incredibly powerful tool, even if it's just something trivial, like finding the right words or correcting mm -hmm. your spelling or correcting your grammar, or in a more technical perspective, providing you help with some scripts, error messages, and so on. I think that the AI is really good at doing that, but I think that you still need this control, this human eye on it. And apart from those more technical limitations, I think that AI has a problem, and I'm not sure whether this problem can ever be resolved. The problem is that it just doesn't care about your company's success or the success of your customer and partner or the feelings or success of your coworkers. So it's basically a very cold system. And I'm a firm believer that empathy and feeling for someone that turns to you for help and advice I think that cannot be replicated by AI anytime soon. I would be very surprised if we ever get at this point, at least not in a very convincing way, I think. Another way to say that is hard to train AI to have an entrepreneurial perspective, right? Which is what we were talking about on this podcast. We've talked about a lot, but I want to crystallize things. And if there was one takeaway that you wanted people to have from this podcast, what would that be? We did touch a lot of very important points. I think in my opinion, what people should really think more and take away from this discussion here is that thinking in systems and thinking about sustainable value, constantly motivating people to reflect. And even if it's something as simple as during stand-ups, these lunch breaks or whatever, to sit back and say, what are the activities that I'm doing each day? And which of those activities do I understand create sustainable value for my customers in which I do not understand, I think that's very powerful and people need to make sure that they are constantly reflecting on what they are doing under this context. There really needs to be more focus on teaching everyone in the company what it is really about. And this is providing sustainable value for customers. I think we could probably go on another couple hours, but what I'd love to do is if people had questions as a follow-up, would it be appropriate to give a link to your LinkedIn profile so they could get a hold of you? Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Thomas, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of these insights and changing the way that we think more entrepreneurially about how we provide sustainable value and grow our businesses. I really appreciate all your feedback. Thanks for having me, Steve. It was a pleasure. Nice discussion. And as you said, if anyone has any questions, wants to know more, can contact me on LinkedIn anytime.